Hi, yes, hello everyone, I'm Gavin.js, and the other day I was looking for inspiration on YouTube, like you do, and I came across this tutorial by Ducky3D, where he talks about dynamic paint and all of the cool things you can do with it, and for some reason that bounced around in my head for a couple of days, and eventually turned into, why don't we make a long exposure star night in Blender? So that's what I'd like to do today, and let's jump into it. But before we do, I've had a few people leave comments asking technical questions on my previous couple of tutorials, which is awesome, thank you. It's really awesome to me that some of you are trying out some of my ideas, trying to incorporate it into your own projects. And so I thought to myself, the comments section isn't the best place for technical advice. So now we have a Discord where you guys can go ahead and reach out to me, ask technical questions, talk to each other. I thought it would be a really cool opportunity to try and build a community around technical art and trying to help each other out. So if you find this sort of thing interesting, you want technical help, and you, maybe you're interested in what I'm doing in the future before it gets uploaded on YouTube, definitely check it out because we just passed 100 subscribers on the channel, which is not the biggest milestone ever, but I'm a big fan of celebrating the little things because your support really shows me that this is the sort of thing that's worth investing my time and energy in. So thank you all for your support. Check out the Discord server. And finally, let's hop into it. <laughs> So just jumping into Blender here, I just started off with the default sphere and I scattered some points across it. And then what I did was I moved all of my points to zero, zero, but keeping the individual points Z values. What this allowed me to do was keep a spherical distribution of points, but just on the Z axis so that then I could measure the distance between where the points were and where they are. That may sound a little crazy, but the reason for this is because we're going to be instancing a bunch of arcs. And I want those arcs to all sit on that sphere. So if we have the points where they'll be instanced on that vertical axis, and then use that distance we calculated to scale each of those arcs, all of them will sit nicely on the surface of our original sphere. If that sounds like an odd way of doing this, that's because it is. There's a million different ways to get this sort of output, but for the time being, this is where my mind went. Eventually, I'd like to make a trails node and maybe use simulation nodes to do some more wizardry, but for now, we're just gonna be working with arcs. Also, we're gonna store our initial position. That's not entirely necessary, as I found out later, but it'll come in handy for materials. So now we're going to play with the sweep angle of our arcs. We'll come back to this in a minute, but for now we just want that to animate as time progresses. So now we're going to create the profile of our arcs. And that's fairly straightforward. We're just going to take the factor of our spline, which is a value that goes from 0 to 1 from start and end of our curve. And then we can use this color ramp node to interpolate that so that the grayscale value represents the thickness of our curve. So if we take that value and feed it into the radius of our set curve radius node, and then that into a curve to mesh node, along with a curve circle, that'll give us exactly the geometry we're looking for. And then the last thing we want here is to just add some rotation. Right now the curve is just animating from a single point to then forming a full circle, but really we wanna move the whole arc, not just increase its length. So we're gonna add some rotation here. So we're going to go ahead and just rotate all of our geometry. And again, don't worry about that. We're going to redo those nodes for that rotation in a second. And yeah, that is our geometry done. And the last thing we have to do is to output the position attribute that we saved at the very beginning. So yeah, this is the full node network with all of the values shown so that you can go ahead and duplicate this if you'd like to, or just look over it to kind of understand the logic that I've set up here. So let's just clean this up because it is incredibly important, in my opinion, to make sure to label your nodes and your node groups and organize it so that you understand where all the wires are going and how everything's supposed to be working. And just to give you an idea of what I mean, here's everything labeled and organized really nicely, except for the little areas where we need to loop our animations. So that's what we're going to tackle next, because when I was working on that part, it was about 1 a.m. when I called it a day. And so then uh, 6 a.m. Gavin looked at that and went, no, 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 that's not how this does. <laughs> so I came back, redid it, reworked everything, and I added a few extra features to it as well, where I, I made it so that I can control the number of loops per animation. I can control the maximum and minimum length of each arc 
I ended up with a very dynamic tool, which is really nice, and I may even just turn this into a more abstract system. I've done this a couple of times now, and it's really useful, so if you're interested in a tutorial on how I loop animations, definitely let me know, and I would be happy to make one. And now we've got the final node network. This is with everything labeled, everything's in there, and it's all cleaned up so you can see exactly how everything's flowing and what each node is supposed to be doing. And this is our final result. We've got a bunch of points here. They're all tracing those arcs. It all animates so that it rotates continuously, and then our arcs change length in a way that it makes it look like they accelerate and then slow down a little bit, but they never reverse. It all turned out really well, and I'm very happy with the end result here. The geometry is great, and it's gonna look so cool once we start adding materials, and then play with our camera settings a little bit. So first things first, I threw in a camera, scaled everything up so that we can kind of pan around here and get everything lined up, give our geometry a neat rotation because horizontal lines aren't exactly what I was going for. And then this is where the magic happens. I wasn't really getting anything that I liked with the default 50 millimeter camera. So I played with the focal length a whole bunch and I found that a focal length of five millimeters looks so cool. It's incredibly trippy. It's super unrealistic, but that's fine because, I mean, long exposures don't look like this anyway. This is already a very artistic interpretation of a long exposure, so that's fine. I like this trippy, warped perspective. It just, it looks so good in the final result. So here's where we get to use that attribute that we saved before. What I did was I brought in the initial position of all of our points when we first scattered them, and then we can use that to generate these colors. In retrospect, this was completely unnecessary because we could have just used a random value node and it would have achieved the exact same thing. But I thought I was being clever at the time, so keep that in mind because it's really useful to be able to export attributes from geometry nodes and bring them into materials to play around with, but here is just super unnecessary. After I got those random values established, I added a curves node and an HSV node. These two together I kind of just played around with for a good long while until I got colors that I really liked. I'm sure somebody with more robust knowledge of color theory could do this a lot faster, but I kind of just had fun playing around with these curves until I got something that was still a little bit random but was all in a very nice color scheme. It was really fun. I did go back and tweak it a few times, so these are not the final colors, but next I moved on to playing with the background because you never really want a fully black background. That just doesn't look great. In my opinion, it, it looks much better if you have a very dark blue. So I got a sphere pulled in here so that we could use a Fresnel node to give a nice gradient between black and a super dark like teal, not even a solid blue, like a really nice deep teal. And that just looks so good with the colors I ended up for those arcs streaking across the sky. It all just blended well together, but I used that as the base color for that sphere, as well as a little bit of emission, just to really make sure that it popped and it's not super, super noticeable, but that's kind of the point that it just bleeds into the background and it's not just solid black, but it looks very natural. So after I got that well established, I mean, I go back and play with the colors a few times, but then I dropped in a circle here. I could have used a plane, but whatever. And I just used a basic material here. I really cranked up the metalness to get all of those reflections in to really add intrigue to those streaking lines. And I thought it'd be fun if this looked kind of like we're sitting on a lake and the sky's being reflected back up. And then later on, I'll add in a little bit of noise to the roughness to make it look like the water's moving over time with that, again, going for that long exposure kind of effect. And it ends up looking really cool. And then finally here towards the end, I decided that we needed a focal point, right? something to kind of ground this scene in reality. It doesn't necessarily need that. There are a lot of abstract things that I could have done here, but I had this nature scene initially in my mind with that long exposure, right? So I really wanted like this tiny rocky island in the middle. So I have this rock generator plugin that's really neat to make some nice basic rocks 
spawned a few of those in and then I added in a tree and some grass a little plain to just make sure that it doesn't just look like rocks sticking out and it looks weird and I had to position that so close to the camera because that five millimeter focal length just kind of messes everything up but I, I found the right spot where it looks good and it doesn't look too too distorted in hindsight i maybe should have rendered it out twice but also having a different focal length could have made things weird so maybe something to look into in the future but after i added in those rocks and that tree it just grounded everything and made it feel like this is a real place like you could go out somewhere and on a lake and see something weird and ridiculous like this and then there's one more thing I discovered while I was working on this and and so just to see what would happen I dropped the samples way down but with the denoise set to the default values I got these sort of analog looking artifacts popping up that kind of just smoothed everything out and it looked really cool and it just once again added to that analog effect that I was looking for with that long exposure. And it just made everything feel so much more grounded. But without further ado, let's take a look at the final results. Thank you all for coming on this journey with me. It's been a different video, but I also feel like I say that just about every video. So. Anyway, take care, everybody, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.